Um, my name is Adrienne Jeanette. I'm the assistant curator here, and um, we decided to start some lunchtime lectures this year. And Jill was kind enough to agree to do this one. As you see, we have the Ding Darling and the Maynard Reese exhibition up, and Jill wrote some wonderful interpretive essays for some of the Darling um, etchings out over there, prints that I'm sure you'll go look at. And so we thought he would be a really great uh, person to talk a little bit more about them. He obviously has a huge history here at Iowa State um, and with natural resources, the ecology department, I think it was. Natural resources, ecology, and management. They, they made it really like long. a million words. Yeah. <laughs> um, and obviously he's a great ecologist and interpretive um, specialist and all those things. And he can tell you more about his history too. But um, hopefully it will be a fun time. We're going to get the move around so you won't be sitting for too, too long. But thank you so much again. My pleasure. Thank you for, for uh, inviting me and thank all of you for coming and being a part of it. So I appreciate that. I want to give you a little bit of um, background. What happened to those uh, cartoons? They're right here. Oh, good. Oh, would you pass those out to me? That'd be great. Thank you. Um, a little bit of, of background about um, sort of the, the times that Ding Darling came into, uh, what he was experiencing um, uh, when he first uh, uh, not only was growing up, but also when he uh, became uh, a cartoonist, first for the uh, Sioux City Journal and then later for the Point Register. In the late 18th century, um, uh, uh, excuse me, the late 19th century, uh, in the 1800s, wildlife in Iowa and the rest of the nation were, were suffering population declines like we've never seen before. We've, we've never seen before in our history. Um, uh, expansion of Euro-Americans from the East Coast into the West, including Iowa, uh, uh, and, and across that, uh, that, that, that this great land, then with the railroads coming as well, um, it really provided this sort of demand and opportunity for uh, protein. Uh, pioneering is a very tough business, and uh, uh, our our ancestors needed lots and lots of protein to uh, to do that, and, the, and to do that, they were uh, provided that protein not by going to the store, not by uh, buying a package or anything, but by uh, buying meat from what were called market hunters. I, it, it really disturbs me to even call them hunters because in the sense I'm a hunter and, and I don't see myself in the same sort of vein as that, but we have to consider what the, the topic at the time was. As a result of market hunting, uncontrolled, people could shoot what they wanted, whenever they wanted, as many as they wanted. Uh, truckloads of, of geese and ducks, uh, uh, of prairie chickens, of buffalo robes, of elk hides, uh, uh, antlers, all those things went back east to restaurants and buyers on the, uh, in the east coast. As a result of that, Euro-Americans accomplished in about 50 years what uh, Native Americans hadn't done in thousands of years. They decimated wildlife populations. By the turn of the century, by 1900, there were no deer left in Iowa. Hard to believe today. There were no deer left in Iowa, nor over much of the rest of the region. The bison, what few were left, uh, were, were, were in the, the, uh, the Rocky Mountains. Elk, we now think of as uh, Rocky Mountain elk. We think of elk as this uh, uh, western species. Well, there were elk here in Iowa. In fact, the eastern third of Iowa probably had more elk than they ever had bison. So it, uh, it's, an, it's a prairie species, uh, a savanna species, and we don't think of it uh, quite that way. So this decimation of North American wildlife is the world that, um, that Ding Darling was, uh, was brought into, uh, right at the turn of the century, um, uh, when he first, when they first moved to Sioux City. Uh, there was still some, some, some wildlife left, but not the kinds of numbers that had been there before. Well, fortunately, at that, at that time, um, Hunt, uh, lots of hunters recognized what was happening, and they spoke up. Um, think about his contemporaries at the time. 1900, uh, uh, Teddy Roosevelt was, uh, uh, was became president. And uh, talk about a hunter and a conservationist. Boy, he was one, and he was both of those things. And, and other people, people like John Lacey, Colonel John Lacey, Lacey Kiyosaka Park is named after him here in Iowa. Um, uh, many, many others were, were expressing their chagrin at this loss of, of wildlife. 
So laws began to be passed. Uh, they put in limits on the numbers you could take. When you could take, uh, you couldn't hunt in the spring. Uh, you couldn't uh, uh, use certain kinds of, uh, of weaponry to, uh, uh, to, to, to wipe them out. Uh, so it, it, it really began to change. So wildlife, which was uh, um, uh, so long considered a commodity, began to change in the public's eye, very, very slightly. But still, there was no funding for wildlife. They began to uh, uh, do things like parks and, and, and national wildlife refuges. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt had the first National Wildlife Refuge uh, named that, that, that refuge. Um, uh, they passed laws, things like the, um, um, uh, the, the, the uh, Migratory Bird Protection Act, uh, lots, of, lots of laws. But there was nobody out there to enforce the laws. There were no real penalties <coughs> if you violated the law. And there was no research going on to, to change what people knew about wildlife. Ding Darlin changed that. And that's how profound, uh, I, I want you to understand how <coughs> profound a change it was. Uh, Ding Darling, um, who's a Republican, made his living as a, uh, as a political cartoonist. Uh, at that point, for the Des Moines Register, he started out with, um, uh, with the Sioux City Journal. But he made his living day-to-day -day living as a political cartoonist. This is one of oh, thousands of his cartoons. I was mentioning to some of you earlier, if you go online to the uh, University of Iowa uh, <laughs> <laughs> archives, they have all of his cartoons online, and you can follow them. It's really a fascinating journey. You can follow them from his early days at the Sioux City Journal to his, uh, uh, his uh, through 1949, uh, when he finally retired from you see the progression of his, uh, of his art, of his artistic ability. It's truly amazing, so you should take a look. He made his living as a, as a cartoonist, and his cartoons were, uh, were pretty profound. Um, some of them, uh, uh, he took lots of industry to task. Uh, in this case, he's talking about old man deforestation, who was, in fact, uh, uh, the... the um, uh, the forest in products industry at the time. He took them to task. He took uh, the U.S. Flood Commission. Anybody know who that was? <coughs> the forerunner of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. <laughs> so, okay, took them to task for just standing and watching it. Uh, uh, you know. He wasn't afraid to take anyone to task, uh, as political cartoonists are wont to do. They, they really did uh, quite the job. Uh, growing up in a state, an agricultural state like Iowa, he took farmers to task for the kinds of things that was happening to the uh, that were happening to the land, causing erosion. Uh, the title of this is "What That Mud in Our Rivers Adds Up to Each Year," and the equivalent was 125,000 acre, 160 acre farms now moving down our rivers. Pretty amazing stuff. Um, and and uh, so so he made his living this way, but. He was asked as a, uh, uh, as a political cartoonist to go to Washington in 1934. And remember, this is tough for a Republican in those years. He had taken lots of Democrats to task in his, uh, in his cartoons, and yet uh, he was asked by a pretty strong Democrat, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, to go to Washington to head up what was then called the U.S. Biological Survey forerunner of U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. They're not working today, are they? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's, <laughs> that's a, a, a whole other uh, uh, issue, I guess. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, he went to Washington, was there for only two years. Two years, as head of the U.S. Biological Survey. And in that time, had this profound change, created this profound change in, in wildlife history, I think. Perhaps more than any other person was responsible for, I mean, he wasn't even a member of Congress, but he was very, very influential. And he got the um, Migratory Bird Stamp Act passed. Been an idea floating around Washington for a long time, but nobody had had the guts to, uh, to push it or to get it passed. Ding Darling did. 
he had said that he got it uh, signed after it was passed. Uh, Roosevelt hadn't even read the law and uh, signed it before he was on his way out for a fishing trip or something. <laughs> it was pretty amazing. Uh, and he got it. He got it uh, uh, into into uh, um, um, uh, in, into to, uh, uh, in, into law, and and did something that nobody before him had done. And that was that finally they had some funding for conservation. All the laws in the world did no good at all until there was money behind it to actually enforce some of those. That's a profound change. That hunters would pay for conservation. I have to tell you a, a, a story. I was a, a visiting scholar in Taiwan a few years ago in 2006. And I was working with graduate students there, and I talked about the North American model of wildlife conservation. At the cornerstone of the North American model is that hunters pay for conservation. Those students there, uh, who were part of a, uh, a nation that the wildlife had been gone so long, they had no uh, written history about what it, was, what it was like before they came. Um, they were absolutely appalled that you could even put conservation and hunters in the same sentence, let alone fund it from hunting. Um, uh, so it, it, it was really a very, very profound change uh, for, for the, uh, the U.S. model of wildlife conservation, and it was only the first of many to come. Three years after this, uh, the Stamp Act was passed, I think, in 1934. Um, uh, uh, three years after that, we passed, uh, they passed the Pittman-Robinson Act, in which, again, uh, put an excise tax on hunting arms and ammunition, and to today, still, that funds conservation. So hunters still pay for conservation. And they pay for it in lots of other ways, too. Um, um, today, oh, when I was growing up, I think what we had, we had the Isaac Walton League, um, uh, uh, basically as a conservation group. Today, there are all kinds of conservation groups. Uh, and it, it was a worry, I think, in the early days that uh, Gee, was so much, now we're going to dilute the effort if we don't have a single conservation organization like the National Wildlife Federation, for example, that Ding Darling also helped found, uh, was their, uh, one of their presidents. Um, uh, if we don't have a single, if we spread it out, oh, there's, there's Ducks Unlimited, there's, there's uh, Pheasants Forever, there's the National Wild Turkey Federation, there's a, a Trout Unlimited, that, gee, we're, aren't we diluting all of that? No, it turns out that we've actually increased the numbers of uh, who were concerned and helped pay for conservation. Those organizations all um, uh, lead conservation uh, by, by uh, uh, raising money and putting it back into habitat uh, across the nation. So it really was this, this simple design that he made for the first duck stamp. And by the way, um, these prints were actually done after the duck stamp was issued, so it really wasn't the design for the first extent, but that's okay. Um, uh, uh, the idea was, was there. Uh, it, was, it really caused a profound change in conservation uh, history in the United States. And Ding Darling, a, a, a cartoonist, not a biologist, wasn't trained in, in, in that. He was actually a, a musician and an artist. Uh, he changed that history of conservation by finding funding or laws that hadn't been enforced uh, since they were passed in the early 1900s. He found ways then to, to do that. So what I want to do is I want to take you out in the gallery, um, and I'll leave these around. These are, are three of the cartoons. These were part of uh, the 4-H Ding Darling project. I got, got some funding. This is the easiest grant I ever got. It was a, a one-page concept uh, that I submitted to the Ding Darling Foundation. And you know, usually when you write grants, those of you a lot of you have done that. You know that uh, they kind of approve of the idea, and then you go back to really detail out what you want to do. They funded it on that concept paper. <laughs> I was just like, oh my gosh, now, now what am I going to do? And uh, so we did the Ding Darling Project. It uh, came out in 1983, and we used some of Ding's cartoons uh, to get young people to draw cartoons about what their issues were, to use cartooning, to use um, uh, we, we talk a lot about the, the whole art of a cartoon and how, um, uh, how, how different cartoonists uh, use different uh, uh, methodology to 
to uh, uh, they use they use some some uh, uh, common figures. You know, you, you always know what the army looks like here. Uh, 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 old man deforestation always has a beard. I somehow resented that. <laughs> uh, but, uh, uh, and uh, uh, you know, we, and they would then take issues. And they found, in fact, that Ding's cartoons, those issues were still issues today. In fact, we calculated, recalculated um, for 1983, um, how many equivalent of 125,000. 160 acre farms were moving down our rivers in 1983. Okay, had it had gone up from 125,000 or gone down by 1983? <laughs> it had gone up. <laughs> yeah. It had gone up. So the problems were still there. Uh, we put more land under cultivation, uh, taken more land out of protection. And uh, so the problems were, were definitely still there in 1983. And young students use cartoons from the 1930s show uh, uh, those, those, uh, their concerns for the 1980s. That, uh, uh, that project actually went worldwide. I think they're still using some of the water quality stuff in, uh, in India, uh, in schools in India, which shows you how far behind they are, I think. But, uh, okay. Um, so what I'd like to do is to, to move to some of, you can see that he's an amazing artist. Uh, not just a cartoonist, uh, he, he was an artist uh, in his own right. So I want to move to, to a few of the things in the Ding Garland portion of the gallery, uh, gallery and talk about uh, some of what that meant uh, uh, for the time. So if you want to just get up and follow me, we'll go. If you want to drag a chair along, you're more than welcome sure. to the front yeah. of What you saw oh, in the, the duck stamp, which by the way, he just drew apparently on the back of a, a shirt cardboard. He had a shirt in his office and just did a quick sketch, and that's what they used for the duck stamp. It's pretty, pretty amazing. Well, he went back and perfected that and added details, just like he did in his cartoons. Um, uh, but you, you look at this and you say, how did he know? How did he know that the hen usually leads as a, uh, as a pair of mallards is coming in and the, and the drake falls? How did he know that? How did he know that the, the, the wings are down in this sort of delta shape in, in order to, to break to land and to allow wind to pass through those fibers. How did he know that? Well, he knew it from where he grew up. He grew up in, in uh, um, the time he was 10, he grew up in, in Sioux City and uh, spent lots of time out uh, being a wild child. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I was fortunate enough to, to grow up in southeastern Iowa along the Mississippi River there and spent a lot of my time, and my brothers and I uh, both spent a lot of our time out canoeing the, the, the cedar and the skunk and the Des Moines and the Mississippi, doing things that uh, uh, kids got to do, like many of you did, I know as well. And uh, uh, that, that experience is what gave him the picture in the mind's eye, the picture in the mind's eye, how ducks land. How do you create motion to, to make it as appear that, in fact, uh, uh, there are lots of ducks landing here. He creates his motion with wings in different positions. It's a, it's a truly amazing thing. But he did that because he grew up wild. And uh, you'll see that in a lot of his, uh, uh, a lot of his uh, uh, drawings. Somehow he knows how those quail take off and, and how that pelican sits. And we'll, we'll look at a few of those things here in the next, uh, next few minutes. But it was truly, truly amazing. It's something I think today that he would uh, worry about. Uh, we're being alive today. Uh, uh, would, would worry a lot about is the fact that young children don't get to grow up in the same sorts of circumstances that he did and many of you did, uh, with the chance to uh, get out there and experience things firsthand, and to put those pictures in your mind that then later later allow you to translate that to paper uh, in a way that is accurate as well as uh, are really quite beautiful. Um, you can see, in fact, with the, some of the detail that's involved in, in all of his uh, uh, photos, uh, he's got, um, or his, his photos, did I say photos? My gosh, yeah. <laughs> drawings and prints here. Uh, uh, and you can see the plates here that he made, and then uh, there's, there's a picture, uh, uh, if you have taken a look at the video that's available, it's quite wonderful, uh, has a lot of, uh, incorporated a lot of photos, it's called America's Darling. And uh, uh, it has photos from him. There's a photo in there of him using his printing press to print, uh, to 
try out some of the, the, the prints here. And so he etched these plates uh, from preliminary drawings and then but put, putting the detail of the trees in here and, and the, uh, the, the, the uh, hard stem or soft stem bulrush, uh, just amazing stuff. He, he knew this stuff, but he knew it as much intuitively, I think. He didn't study it in school. He didn't come to Iowa State, unfortunately, uh, and, and study it here. But uh, he went to Beloit College. Uh, it's a college that I started in uh, back in, uh, quite a bit later than, than Ding had been there. And, um, and like Ding, uh, I too failed at some things along the way. <laughs> the way. Uh, but uh, uh, Beloit College uh, uh, gave him his start in cartooning. Uh, but I think he, as he came to that, he came to uh, uh, his art uh, uh, gradually. Uh, so these, these, uh, these prints are, are, are really amazing, but they came from that experience as a child, uh, growing up wild, if you will. Um, back on both walls, and those of you in the back can take a look at some of the bluebills that are landing there. Uh, and over here, the pintails. Uh, these are, these are uh, uh, amazing. The two other species of ducks. Uh, very, very different from the mallards that uh, you see so often. Uh, bluebills, he put them exactly in the kind of habitat that they, uh, they should be in. These are lesser or greater scop. Uh, you can see these at Ada Hayden, if you get out to uh, Ada Hayden. There actually have been a few already. Uh, Wolf told me last night that a few had come in. Uh, even though these are usually a much uh, later season duck. Uh, these, are, these are ducks of big water, of big water. They're diving ducks. And uh, when they're called bluebills by hunters, scop by uh, ornithologists, uh, 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 bluebills because they have a very old oh, kind of a sky blue bill with a little black tip on the end. And these are diving ducks. These are diving ducks. They, they, uh, uh, you, look at, you look at a lake and you see all these species and you say, wow, how do they keep them competing with one another? Well, they sort of partition off that lake in such a way that they, uh, some will feed close to shore, some even feed up on land, some will feed uh, uh, by tipping their rear ends up and, and eating plants and, and uh, snails and other uh, mollusks uh, off the bottom. Uh, others will dive into deeper water and they'll even partition up how deep will they go. The, uh, what used to be called the old squaw, now called the long-tailed duck, is the deepest diver, I think, over 90 feet. Over 90 feet, they pick them up in Lake Michigan that way. Uh, old scots will, will go 20, 25 feet, um, uh, but they're 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 again uh, feeding on other things and partitioning off that lake, so they can all use the same resource without depleting it and without competing with one another. These are uh, our bluebills. They're a, they're a, uh, you can see these two down here. I love these guys. They're doing what's called peering. And again, he, he got this by. Observation. He figured that out. They're peering. They're looking under the water, either looking for something to eat or looking for the best place to die. Pretty, pretty cool. And he, he, he knew that from experience because he was, um, he was a, 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 an amateur, quote unquote, naturalist. No training, but by golly, he sure knew his ducks. Same thing with these um, pintails over here. Uh, pintails are this, this, oh, the handsomest of ducks. Uh, they, they have this, this sort of chocolate brown head. And uh, it's, it's uh, I think Amy described it uh, in, in hers as, uh, her description as sort of velvety brown. I think that's a good description. Uh, and it really, had, they're amazingly handsome, almost like a tuxedo. It's sort of, it's sort of a, a brown tuxedo, as it were, a <laughs> chocolate tuxedo, but, but a very nice tuxedo. These, uh, on the other hand, are not deep water ducks. Uh, he shows them coming back in a snowstorm, and they're one of our earliest ducks back, uh, and they're, they're frequently betting, hoping, in a way, if ducks can hope, uh, that in fact as they go north, uh, they'll find some open water, because it's uh, oftentimes they don't. They're trying to get as far north as they can. Both the scop and the pintails um, nest primarily in the northern prairie provinces of Canada. We do have occasionally get pintails that nest in Iowa, but not very many anymore. Um, uh, the destruction of wetlands uh, really, really changed uh, a lot of things for our, our nesting ducks. Um, Ding, Ding um, was one who not only knew them, but acted on his beliefs, and he knew they were in peril. Uh, one of the things he did here at Iowa State was that he founded 
the Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit. Um, uh, and he did it, talk about commitment, he did it with his own money. You know? He took $3,000 of his own one year, marched up to Beardshire Hall, I could just see him confronting the president there, <laughs> you know, that'd be great, uh, and, and challenged the president of Iowa State to come up with another $3,000 to match his, the $3,000 that he was willing to put up. And he said he would go to the Iowa Conservation Commission, which he did, he happened to be on the Conservation Commission, and get them to pony up another $3,000 to found what is now uh, a national system, but at that time this was the first cooperative fish and wildlife research unit um, uh, in the country. And so in order to find out the kinds of things, what was happening to ducks, where was it they nest, how do we know where they nest? How do they feed? How do they partition the lake? All those things have been found out by people doing research. And uh, he knew how they looked, but he didn't know what they ate. Uh, uh, he knew the habitat that they were in, but he didn't know what kind of habitat they needed all along their migratory route. And he knew, though, he knew enough that research was the way to make that happen. And so he helped found that here at Iowa State, 1932, I think it was. Uh, Irv isn't here, but I think it was 1932. And um, um, uh, then, then when he went to Washington, persuaded the federal government, what an idea. Let's do this cooperatively. Let's have some local money from Iowa State or from, from, from the university. Let's have some state money from the State Natural Resource Agency. And let's have some federal money in it as well. What a concept. Government can actually work together. That's amazing. <laughs> and uh, it was, a, it was a, a, a very unusual for the time. Uh, and certainly an unusual thing for today. Uh, but uh, it is a, a, a very strong concept, again, that sort of profoundly changed this whole idea of funding for conservation. <coughs> he put that money in. He put $3,000 of his own money in for three years. And then when he got in Washington, he uh, set up a private fund it came from uh, uh, state, federal, and the university conference. Still the model today. Do you know, are there still um, <coughs> 42 or 44 of them, or are some of the units closed down? That's really close. Okay, yes. yeah, some, something around there, yep. across, the, across the nation. So, Again, simple idea, coming from an artist, not from a biologist, somebody but who loved the outdoors and loved it from his childhood on profoundly changed the whole uh, system for um, um, uh, the funding of wildlife and research into wildlife across the United States. About the same time, there was a contemporary of Dings, another Iowan, I should say, by the name of Aldo Leopold. Uh, and he was fundamentally changing it as well. Uh, he founded shortly in the 30s. Uh, he was the founding professor in the Department of Wildlife Ecology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, all those uh, Born and raised in southeastern Iowa, in Burlington, and is buried there, as a matter of fact. Uh, and uh, really, uh, the two of them uh, really changed the history of, uh, uh, of game management. In fact, the first game management department in the whole U.S. was at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And he and Ding were close colleagues on, uh, uh, on a number of, uh, of, of the issues of the time. Let's move around to, let's see, where are we? There, as, you, as you move around, uh, let's move from ducks to, to an upland species. Hi, John. Uh, uh, to an upland species now. And you'll see on the other wall over there, we'll go back into that room in a few minutes, Beer. But uh, I wanted you to take a look at this one. He calls this Bud, May, Bud Maytag's um, uh, uh, quail, pet, or Bud Maytag's pets, quail. And uh, uh, his, his drawings of quail are quite remarkable. Uh, the prints that are in, on the other wall over there are also, uh, uh, again, it's, it's the perspective of a hunter who knows what happens when you're hunting quail. Well, what do they do? They all come up together in a covey. Uh, you may have a good pointing dog, or if you're a human hunter, or if the fox, you may be able to smell them and you know they're there. But when they all come up at once, that's how they escape. That's how they say, we're going to confuse the heck out of this potential predator. <laughs> and uh, the longer the predator pauses, the more trouble they're in as a result. Um, 
and and it's a the the kind of thing that uh, that he knew from being being a hunter, that he was uh, he was out there, um, um, actually uh, uh, seeing the covey rise together. Um, uh, the cubbies of quail that, um, uh, that he found so populous in his youth, uh, by the time uh, he, he was drawing some of this, people were trying to raise quail, just as uh, Bud Maytag was. And this is still goes on today, lots of people try and raise pheasants and quail, and then release them, hoping it to add to the population. Well, unfortunately, if we look at the research, it shows that they just simply don't survive. They're there maybe for a short period of time. But somehow, they don't have the smarts that the mother can impart to her young in a natural way that allows them to uh, survive very long at all. Uh, so Bud Maytag was probably only one of uh, uh, many at the time who hoped to supplement the population. If I, I, don't, I don't know if Maytag was raising them for the table, uh, that he was going to uh, raise them himself, but I suspect what he was doing was raising them uh, to train his bird dogs on. Uh, and. Uh, uh, was, was uh, uh, hoping to uh, add to the, to the population. Unfortunately, Darling would um, find it very difficult to even find a covey of quail today. i read you, read you what I wrote. It said, the wide brushy fence rows of Darling's time, so favored by quail, are now nearly gone. The many abandoned farmsteads, littered with farm machinery, old cars, dilapidated buildings, and brush, ideal quail cover have all been cleaned up. Even the many small woodlots that provided wood for stoves as well as quail food and nesting habitat are now converted to neat rows of corn and soybeans. We should not be surprised then that bobwhite quail have nearly disappeared as well. As a youngster he was able to frequently wake up in the morning to the <whistles> call of a, a, a cubby or two uh, right around uh, uh, the place where his home was. Uh, not so today. Very few youngsters uh, in Iowa will probably ever uh, have a chance to hear that, um, uh, that, that, that call of that Bob White again. We somehow have decided that um, another row of crop is much more important than the messy habitat that quail really like. And I think that's a, a really un unfortunate thing for so many reasons. Because it represents, I think, a sort of a change in the values of our culture as well as a change in the wildlife that result from that change in values. Let's go, let's see, let's go into the that uh, I think Dane would be very happy. The, uh, the Santa Bell Captiva National Wildlife Refuge is now the Ding Darling National Wildlife Refuge. And how many of you visited that? Uh, what a place, what an incredible place. I think he would smile um, not only at the, the duck stamp program that's going on today, but he'd also smile at, uh, at the thousands of people that go through that incredible visitor center and the five mile long drive, watching the same wildlife species that he marveled at uh, as well. Um, uh, it's it's a, a truly a, a treat to be able to go to some of these places. I just got back from um, uh, on, on Sunday night uh, uh, from a hunting trip a friend of mine and I took out to the Pier National Grasslands in, um, in South Dakota, near, just south of Pier, South Dakota, in central South Dakota. Thousands and thousands of acres of grasslands. Yes, they're used by cattlemen um, uh, and they, they graze on the grasses out there, but the prairies are still there. The prairie plants are still there and so are things like prairie chickens and sharp-tailed grouse. And it's such a privilege, such a privilege for me to be able to go out there and to walk that land. We walked about, oh, 18 or so miles in three days over up and down hills and lots and lots of uh, uh, things. And at 65, figuring I can still do that, I'm pretty dang <laughs> you know, happy with that. I'm privileged to be able to, to do it. But the fact that we have that land in the first place is truly amazing to me. Because it takes people, it takes people like everyone in this room to make that happen. It takes people who uh, will talk to their, their representatives at the local, at the state, and at the national level and say, this is about me. This is something that I care about. I did a lot of um, paddles this summer on Iowa rivers with uh, 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 taking folks 
uh, we called them uh, critter crawls or critter paddles, where we paddle down a stretch of river and, and look at the wildlife along there. And I said, if each of you contacted one of, of your representatives, doesn't matter if it's a federal, or local, state, or federal level, I just said to them, you know what? Clean rivers and clean water are really important to me. You would probably be the first one that has ever contacted them and said that. So uh, the same thing goes with, with wildlife. That's some things that, you know, Dean Garling was a very influential person. He knew lots of people. He sort of moved in and out of, you know, of the company of presidents and governors and everything with quite just genuine ease. But he did that. Uh, uh, and as he did that, he talked about the things that he was passionate about, that he cared so much about that he was willing to, to, uh, to not only draw something for them, but to put his own money into uh, to study them. Uh, uh, that took courage, just incredible courage. This print here I want to, um, uh, last print I want to talk about, and then we can, uh, we've got a few minutes for questions, or if you want to talk about some other prints, or. Other people make comments, please please do. This is called Iowa as we found it. And he used this in his cartoons quite a lot. Um, uh, you saw the one in there, the, uh, the cartoon with with game management, what the land looks like, and without game management, what the land looks like, you know. And he he uh, would use this technique a lot in his cartooning. But I, I really uh, marveled at this. This is the Iowa that he probably found when he moved to Sioux City when he was 10. Uh, there was still... Uh, lots of game um, uh, in that area. It hadn't been totally uh, farmed yet. Or this is at least as he imagined it. Uh, perhaps it wasn't quite as uh, as pretty as that. Um, uh, but but uh, with 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 quail and ducks and um, uh, other species uh, uh, throughout here, uh, he was a, a, a dyed-in-the-wool Republican, um, a, a, a conservative who knew that the um, the root of that term was conserve. Um, uh, didn't mean other things that uh, have been, been attached to it yet. Uh, and it meant working with others, including people that he might have perceived as enemies. Um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, person of the other, other party, you know, uh, he had opposed all kinds of Roosevelt policies. In fact, uh, some suspicion that maybe Roosevelt got him to come to Washington to shut him up for a couple of years. You know, he couldn't couldn't actually draw any cartoons, and he didn't, wouldn't have time. But uh, uh, given that, he knew that uh, uh, he still felt what, what he, he knew what he felt passionately about, and he got the Duck Stamp Act passed, uh, and and then he, he ended up drawing the, the original Duck Stamp, fundamentally changing the trajectory for wildlife in the United States. Um, Fundamentally changed, and, 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 and when you, when you, if you buy a duck stamp, uh, think about that. That's that we're one of the only countries in the world where hunting um, and hunters fund conservation. Now, in modern days, they're not the only ones by by any means, but that changed the, the, the whole role of uh, 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 the whole trajectory for uh, for wildlife. Today. He formed the idea for and um, served on the Iowa Conservation Commission. And uh, he deliberately kept it out of the hands of the governor. He said this, uh, uh, the head of the Iowa Conservation Commission ought to be appointed by the citizens, not by the governor. Well, unfortunately, all that changed in 1986 when they reorganized the state DNR. And um, the current governor, um, uh, uh, the governors before him since 1986 have all appointed the head of the DNR. Most of them have appointed people who were professionals, people who were trained by the cooperative units, uh, by, by folks who, uh, uh, who were biologists, uh, uh, who valued research and science. Uh, unfortunately now, the current governor has decided to uh, politicize the agency in making at-will employees uh, not just the, uh, the head of the DNR, but uh, down to, from the division, clear down to the bureau level. So that we might, uh, if we're uh, uh, going, continue on this route, um, make our decisions not based on biology and science, but on politics. And I think that that's um, a, a, real, a real threat. We might uh, be, uh, go the way of Illinois, not be as bad as uh, <laughs> Illinois and as dysfunctional, and I hope that that, uh, that doesn't happen. Uh, we 
we're certainly on that direction, on that 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 uh, uh, that trajectory uh, politically in Iowa, and I hope that we begin to remove that, uh, 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 change that. It's going to take citizens, though, who are willing to do that, to change that, that idea uh, and, and put it back in the hands of scientists and biologists, not, not in the hands of politicians. I think if we don't, um, we won't see the kinds of uh, uh, wildlife that, uh, that Ding Darling, uh, the numbers that uh, Darling has portrayed here in these wonderful prints. Um, Iowa, as we found it, he, uh, he wrote this, he said, if I could put together all the virgin landscapes which I knew in my youth and show what has happened to them in one generation, it would be the best object lesson conserv in conservation that could be printed. <laughs> it's amazing. When we look at change in our own lives, in our own homes, in our own landscapes, uh, and we see change uh, in a direction that we don't want to see, I think uh, it's our responsibility, just as he did, uh, that both his cartoons and his art to say, um, let's bring some of this back. Uh, and, and it takes all of us uh, to do that. Well, thank you very much for uh, coming today, and we'll be glad to take any questions or comments or whatever.